Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Towards the end of the second essay in Friedrich Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morals, he discusses a set of processes by which he says that human beings eventually develop fuller and fuller conceptions of gods, deities, spiritual beings that are held to be greater than humanity and in, which, in relation to which we have a set of duties, obligations, guilt. And, you know, in his view, these are really projections into the social sphere, into culture, uh, accompanied by all sorts of material artifacts and rituals of ideal beings that, that, that don't really exist, but in relation to which we orient ourselves. And, you know, if we think about the Christian God that he's going to talk about, um, we, we almost can't get away from it unless we make some really significant efforts. The vulgar forms of atheism, as we're going to see, don't really get you completely away from that. <clears throat> and so this begins in um, chapter 19 of the second essay. He tells us that within the original tribal community, and so we should think about tribal communities, right? We're speaking of primeval times. The living generation always recognized a juridical duty towards earlier generations and especially towards the earliest, which founded the tribe. And so, you know, we're talking about the living in some, some respect, right? The older people, but also those who have died, the ancestors and the founders, the primeval ancestors. And then he tells us that the conviction reigns, and this is very important, that it's only through the sacrifices and accomplishments of the ancestors that the tribe exists. So what has demarked you as the people or the human beings, the group that you are, are the sacrifices and the accomplishments that the ancestors engaged in. And, and these are very often in terms of legends or myths, narratives. Um, they may be reenacted in, in rituals that allow the ancestors to be in some respect present, right? <clears throat> and so the ancestors are really <clears throat> the creditors. They're the ones to whom one owes something. And what do you owe them? Well, this is where it gets very interesting. You pay the ancestors back for their sacrifices and accomplishments with sacrifices and accomplishments, right? Sacrifices of, of different forms, perhaps, but also by trying to do something. And Nietzsche tells us you have to pay them back with these, and we recognize a debt. Now, here's a key part. That constantly grows greater. Why would it grow greater? Well, because you can never truly pay it back. He tells us that... Um, what can you give the ancestors in return? Sacrifices initially as food in the course of sense, feasts, music, honor, above all, obedience. For all customs as works of the ancestors are also their statutes and commands, statutes and commands. Can one ever give them enough? And so paradoxically, the more that you do pay them back, the more you reproduce a situation in which you do have to pay them back. And you're also sending a message to future generations, some of whom are alive and watching you, seeing you repaying the ancestors. And it becomes a, a guilt. It becomes something that you're required to do it. There's consciousness consciousness. 
of debt, as he goes on to say. And so what do we have here? Uh, he says, uh, the fear of the ancestor and his power, the consciousness of indebtedness to him, increases according to this kind of logic in an interesting way. In, in exactly the same measure as the power of the tribe increases. As the tribe itself grows ever more victorious, independent, honored, and feared. So you don't discharge the debt by attempting to discharge the debt and succeeding in doing the things that you think would discharge the debt. Instead, you just create more of it because you could say, well, the ancestors are helping us out. Now we really know that we have to sacrifice to them, right? And we have more resources that we can sacrifice to them. And for tribes or peoples or whatever we want to call them, this gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And he also tells us every step towards the decline of a tribe, every misfortune, every sign of degeneration, of coming disintegration, diminishes fear of the spirit of its founder and produces a meaner impression of his cunning foresight and present power. And so, you know, success breeds more success. Failure breeds distrust and more failure. And what do we see going on here? The, the stronger tribes gobble up the weaker tribes. Uh, you know, the, the people are, are viewed as having been abandoned by their tribal gods. And as he goes on, he says, if we imagine this rude kind of logic carried to its end, the ancestors of the most powerful tribes are bound eventually to grow to monstrous dimensions through the imagination of growing fear and to recede into the darkness of the divinely uncanny and imaginable in the end, the ancestor is transformed into what? A god, a deity, All right? So he says, perhaps this is even the origin of gods, an origin out of fear. And he, you know, he's not saying this is absolutely uh, the only way that gods can come about, but he's saying that, that this would be a, a plausible way. And then he says, whoever should feel obligated to add, but out of piety also, would hardly be right. For the greatest part of the existence of man is prehistory. To be sure, he would be quite right for the intermediate age in which the noble tribes developed, who indeed paid back their originators, their ancestors, with interest, all the qualities that had become palpable in themselves, the noble qualities. So he's talking about here, you know, the primary valuation and the sort of aristocratic morality, attributing to those gods all these great things. Nietzsche is not talking about what we could call Chthonian gods or, or gods of commoners either, but you know, you, you can see what's going on here in a lot of uh, religious developments. Then he says something new happens as well. And this is in section 20. It says, history shows the consciousness of being in debt to the deity did not come to an end with the organization of communities on the basis of blood relations. So, you know, at first we've got uh, tribes, clans, whatever you want to call them, that are connected by some sort of blood relation. And then we see societies expanding as they become more successful. They start taking in other people. They may, you know, enslave or overthrow other people, bring them in. Other people might be attracted to their success, come in as immigrants. And now we have a multi, let's call it multi-ethnic or multi-tribal uh, society. And what happens there? He says, even as humans inherited the concepts good and bad from the tribal nobility, right? It also inherited, along with the tribal and family divinities, the... The burden of still unpaid debts and the desire to be relieved of them. So you take on the gods of the people who you live among. You inherit the family and the tribal gods, and then they cease being family and tribal gods. They become the gods of the city. They become the gods of the country. They become the gods of the larger, uh, more, you know, uh, what would we call it? complex people. And along with that goes this burden of debt and the desire to be released from debt. And he goes on and he says that um, the transition is provided by those numerous slave and dependent populations who, whether through compulsion or through servility and mimicry, adapted themselves to the master's 
cult of the gods. This guilty feeling of indebtedness continued to grow for several millennia, always in the same measure as the concept of God and the feeling of divinity increased on earth and was carried to the heights. And, you know, he talks about different peoples struggling against each other, the entire history of ethnic struggle, victory, reconciliation, fusion, everything that precedes the definitive ordering of rank of the different national elements in every great racial synthesis is reflected, here's a very interesting idea, in the confused genealogies of their gods, in the sagas of the gods' struggles, victories, and reconciliations. And so what is he saying there is that the stories, the narratives, the myths are reflecting this process of accumulation of gods, of bringing them together. And it's going to be messy. It's going to be confusing. It's not going to all make perfect sense, right? Because this process itself is complex. He says, the advance towards universal empires is always also an advance towards universal divinities. Despotism with its triumph over the independent nobility prepares the way for some kind of monotheism. Well, this is a very interesting idea, isn't it? And we can look at a lot of different religions and say, well, they're not strictly monotheistic, but you know, there's certainly a God who's on top. Well, that would be reflective of what Nietzsche's talking about here. Now he goes on and he talks about Christianity and a little bit of its aftermath in a Christian Europe that is, you know, de-Christianizing itself in the time of Nietzsche. And he suggests that the Christian God is in a certain way a maximal God so far. It is the most successful of these gods, you know, spread all over the earth. He says, uh, it was, it was, uh, the adv- advent of the Christian God was therefore accompanied by the maximum feeling of guilty indebtedness on earth. And then he suggests that, um, We've gradually entered on the reverse course. There's no small probability with the irresistible decline of faith in the Christian God. There's also a considerable decline in mankind's feeling of guilt. Um, he says that atheism and a second kind, a kind of second innocence belong together. Uh, the, the prospect cannot be dismissed that the complete and definitive victory of atheism might free mankind of this whole feeling of guilty indebtedness. This is a, a, an idea that he's going to kick around in various works, also in the third essay, and say, mm, actually not that much, right? That the, the problem is of a death of God and what we do in its aftermath, which can still leave us with all this guilt, we just displace it in other ways. Now, he talks about, and this is in, um, here we go, uh, he talks uh, in, the, in the next section, about um, what happens with Christianity itself. And he tells us that this this, uh, problematic of guilt and duty winds up getting turned against the debtor. So the aim, he says, is to preclude pessimistically once and for all the prospect of a final discharge. The aim now is to make the glance recoil disconsolately from an iron impossibility. The aim is now to turn back the concepts guilt and duty, but back against who? So you've got well, several choices, the debtor, the creditor, right? So the debtor, who's that? Well, that's us. That's us human beings. And so Nietzsche says that this is where we get the notion of something like original sin. He says, uh, here we go. We, what, you know, finally they're, they're uh, turned back against this, this debtor. And we can think about uh, the beginning of the human race, the primal ancestor who's now burdened with a curse or of nature from whom went womb, from whose womb mankind arose and into whom the principle of evil is projected now or of existence in general. And now we start to turn it against the creditor, right? So if you think about what original sin is, we can look at us and, oh, we're all a mess, right? And then we can say, well, who's responsible for this mess? Well, the ancestor, Adam, Adam and Eve, Right. And then maybe Cain plays a role too, right? Because he, he's kind of a screw up as well, or whoever else we want. But then we can push it further back. Maybe it's the devil. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's existence itself, the nature of things. And he tells us that um, we can have a nihilistic withdrawal, a desire for nothingness, a desire for its antithesis, for a different mode of being. And then he tells us 
We stand before the paradoxical and horrifying expedient that afforded temporary relief for tormented humanity. That stroke of genius on the part of Christianity. And what is that stroke of genius? A God who sacrifices God itself. In this case, you know, Jesus with the incarnation and the atonement. He says, God sacrifices himself for the guilt of mankind. God himself makes payment to himself. God is the only being who can redeem man from what has become unredeemable. The creditor sacrifices himself for his debtor out of love. And then Nietzsche jokes around, can one credit that? Out of love for his debtor. So this is a new advance. Not only is Christianity a maximal religion in that it has a God who's like maximally powerful, but it's also a God who does the paradoxical, who absolves the debtor of the debt that none other could, that no effort on the part of the debtor could ever remove and does so through love. And then Nietzsche says, okay, how does this actually work? Can this, can this really be effective? And he says, this is actually the human being's bad conscience that is sort of working itself through. He says, you could say that the human being could respond and say, thank God, right? <laughs> Literally, I'm free. I don't have to worry about any of this, this guilt and, uh, I don't have to make any, any atonement myself. This is wonderful. That doesn't really work though. He goes on and he says, the human being still feels guilt before God. He apprehends in God the ultimate antithesis of his own ineluctable animal instincts. He reinterprets these as a form of guilt before God, as hostility, rebellion, insurrection. And he ejects from himself all his denial of himself, his nature, naturalness, and actuality. And God becomes God the judge, God the hangman. But also at the same time, God the forgiver, God the lover. And at the very end of section 22, he says, all of this is interesting, but also of a gloomy, black, unnerving sadness so that one must forcibly forbid oneself to gaze too long into these abysses. Here is sickness beyond any doubt, the most terrible sickness that ever raged in man, whoever can still bear to hear how is the, in this night of torment and absurdity, there's resounded the cry of love, the cry of the most nostalgic rapture of redemption through love will turn away. Seized by invincible horror. Too long, the earth has been a madhouse. So this, this uh, prospect of God absolving us of guilt through this sacrifice that's at the center of Christianity on the part of Christ Nietzsche thinks doesn't really, doesn't really acquire us what we need. And as a matter of fact, just intensifies the problematic. Now he wants to also in the next section, uh, provide us with an alternative. Whether or not this really conforms to Greek religion is a good question, but he says that, um, we don't actually have to go down that path. He says that the conception of gods in itself need not lead to the generation of the imagination we had to consider that there are nobler uses for the invention of gods than for the self-crucifixion and self-violation of man in which Europe over the past millennia achieved its distinctive mastery. That is revealed by even a mere glance at the Greek gods. And I think, yeah, you're actually better off if it is a brief glance and you don't look at Greek religion too closely because then it might not map on all that well to what Nietzsche's talking about. But he says that, the, that we have an alternative here. Um, the Greek gods are reflections of what he calls noble and aristocratic men. Perhaps even the female deities are such, or perhaps we should read men as, as humankind in this case. And he tells us that the Greek gods are used, here we go, for the longest time these Greeks used their gods precisely so as to ward off the bad conscience, so as to be able to rejoice in their freedom of soul, the very opposite of the use to which Christianity put its god. They went very far in this direction, the Greeks, these splendid and lion-hearted children, right? So... And there's, there's another thing that, that's going along here as well. Instead of focusing on sinfulness, um, 
human beings are viewed as foolish. So he tells us the Olympian gods look at them and say how foolish they are. He thinks when he observes the misdeeds of mortals and foolishness, folly, a little disturbance in the head. This much even the Greeks of the strongest, bravest age conceded of themselves as the reason for much that was bad and calamitous. Foolishness, not sin. Now, it's not a complete solution. He says even this disturbance presented a problem. How is it possible? And so noble Greeks asked themselves for centuries in the face of every incomprehensible atrocity or wantonness, he must have been deluded by a god, right? And he says this expedient is typical of the Greeks, that the gods justify human beings rather than, you know, replicating this or intensifying this dynamic of guilt that can never be satisfactorily discharged. So, you know, this is some interesting reflections on the idea about how we human beings would come up with conceptions of God that could actually draw us in generation after generation, uh, you know, require worship, require sacrifices, require belief, and thereby influence entire cultures. Um, Christianity being sort of like the most successful of these versions, but one that just intensifies the problematic involved there. So that's, that's what's going on in essay two.